All right, you guys ready to rock and roll? All right, it's going to be an incredible weekend with Joyce Meyer. Jared's already talked to you about it. I'm just telling you myself, I'm just telling you myself, I am so looking forward because Joyce feeds me. So I'm coming Friday, Saturday, all day Saturday with my Bible, my notebook, and my pen. I'm going to be down front taking notes because Joyce feeds me. And do we need to connect the rest of the dots? I submit to you that if she feeds me, she can feed you. So I hope that you'll come and take advantage of this life-changing gift that's in her life. Amen. Amen. All right, here we go. If you have your Bible with you tonight, open it with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians, uh, you know where that is? It's right in front of 2 Thessalonians. Yeah, I know. That's why I do this, because I know those things. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It's a very revealing verse of Scripture. If you've never seen it, this is very revealing. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23. And the very God of peace, the very God of peace, knows that he's not the God of chaos, he's the God of peace. The very God of peace sanctify you holy, right? Holy, W-H, so your whole being, your whole being. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the first thing I want to point out to you, a lot of you have heard this before, some of you haven't, and it's very important that you understand this in your, in your spiritual life, your spiritual development, your growth as a, as, a, as a child of God, as a person, that you, 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 the real you, you are a three-part being. The real you, the real you is a spirit being. You, you are a spirit. You have a soul. Your soul is made up basically of your mind, your emotions, and your will. I'll give you some other definitions in a moment that include some other things that come out of that, give you more understanding. But it's basically your mind, your emotions, and your will. And you, you and your soul live in your body. Your body cannot live without you. You can live without your body. All right? Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That combination of your spirit and your soul, there is a combination of the two, is what the Bible calls your heart, all right? It's what makes you, you, okay? Your heart. Hmm? If you believe in your heart, as a man thinketh in his heart, right? In your spirit and in your soul. Now, needless to say, this teaching is going to focus primarily on getting your soul in a good place. Getting your soul in a good place. Now, he begins here, right? So we're going to... He, what he says applies to the spirit and the body, but we're, mo we're focusing right now on the soul, so let's just jump into that. Let's take these, these words, uh, sanctified, preserved, blameless, and let's look at them for a moment and talk about them and see how they are pointing towards a condition of our soul. Now, this is going to be important to you in the next verse that we read, as you'll see, all right? Now, the, dic the Bible dictionary can find, can, can defines your soul as your mind, your emotion, your will, but it also means this. Your soul is the seat of the senses, your desires, your affections, your appetites, and your passions. All right? Now, obviously, he's talking about appetite other than what you may have right now because you didn't get dinner, Okay? But he's talking about that your soul has an appetite. This is important. You need to know this about yourself, right? How are you going to get your soul in a good place if you don't know what it's doing? You know, what, what, what makes it? What, what, how, it how it percolates? What, 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 what makes all the cylinders hit, right? It's amazing how many people just kind of bebop through life and don't ever take a moment to learn anything about how they operate. Okay? So he says here, the seat. So the soul is the seat of your senses, so your senses are processed through your soul, okay? It's your soul that tells your hand to get it, get it off of the burner, right? It's your, it's, your, it's your soul that does that, your mind, your most of your will. The seat of your senses, your desires. Your soul has desires, affections, appetites, passions. So your spirit and your soul, the Bible dictionary goes on to say, live in the natural life, but will also live beyond death. So your soul and your spirit, your heart, 
is what goes into eternity. Your body goes back to dust, but your spirit and your soul, your heart, go into eternity. So your soul is very interesting in that it can operate in this natural realm, but it is totally comfortable in the, ne- in the, in the spiritual realm too. So it functions in that realm also in harmony with your spirit man, okay? In harmony with who you are really and truly. Now go with me to Hebrews 4, okay? And you'll see something here. Hebrews 4, okay? I want to do a little kind of uh, prep work here before we get into the actual meat scripture. Hebrews 4, verse 12. It's important that you see this and you understand this. For the word of God, the what? The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the, that would include the soul, right? Because your heart is made up of your spirit and your soul. So here he said that the word can separate between your spirit, your soul, and your body. Now, I think that the word is the only instrument, if you would, in the earth that can do that, that can draw a line and show you this is spirit and this is soul, right? Galatians, the fifth chapter, talks about the fruit of the spirit, not the fruit of the soul, the fruit of the spirit. So he's specifying there that things, things that come out of our spirit, man, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith, right? Those are all fruits of your born-again spirit, man, okay? So the Word can teach you this is soul, this is spirit, this is body. It can divide that for you, okay, so that you can understand it if you want to. And I submit to you that the more time you think about this and the more you let of God's Word penetrate you, the more that Word is going to do this work in you, which is discern for you or judge the thoughts and the intents of your heart. I think all of us tonight, all of us tonight would not hesitate in saying that when we walked in here tonight, not every thought and intent in us is, "Mm mm-hmm. Right? I think, would we all be honest enough to say that tonight, that there are some thoughts and intents in us that might need to be judged? And there's some thoughts and intents that might need to be developed more. And there's some thoughts and intents that might need to be starved to death and pushed out of our lives. Amen? Amen. But how am I going to know which? If I listen to the world, and remember uh, Romans the 12th chapter says, be not molded by the fleeting fashions of the age. The world is constantly trying to get its thoughts and intents into our souls, into our hearts, constantly to manipulate us and move us and get us to do certain things the way it wants us to do, think certain ways, act certain ways, you know, and we see a lot of that. You know, cultures shift and change based upon popular media or whatever's going on around us. Okay, so we have to be on guard. How many of you agree with that? You've got to guard your heart, your spirit, and your soul. Why? Because out of it come the boundaries or the controlling factors of your life. Wow. Okay, So I want to get my soul in a good place. How about you, right? I assume you do since you're here on Wednesday night. Okay? All right? So so back back to 1 Thessalonians, right? Uh, Go go back there with me real quick. There were some words there I I forgot to give you some definition of that are important. All right? 1 Thessalonians 5. He said, and I pray your... That, that, that the God of peace sanctify you, your whole spirit, your soul, and your body. The word sanctify means made clean, rendered pure in a moral sense. All right, so one of the first things we're going to discover here, to get my soul in a good place, God is going to bring a sense of mor- pure morality to me. Okay? He's going to emphasize morality to me. It's not a popular word in our culture today, but our culture is going to hell in a handbasket. All right? And so there is a, 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 one of the first things that a lot of Christian people encounter, and, and they're not quite sure what to do with it. Right? Is that when, when, they, when they start hanging around with God and they start reading the Word and they start coming to a church that teaches Word, even though I may not talk to you about something, suddenly you know in your heart, wow, you know, I shouldn't be doing that. I, I shouldn't, that, that's not, that's, 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 that's immoral. 
I, said, I, sh- I shouldn't be doing that. You know, we, we shouldn't be doing that. Hmm? Now, this is where a lot of people get upset with God and get upset with preachers. All right? Don't, you know, don't, 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 don't get mad at me. I'm just bringing you the message. Okay, so, you know, it's just a reality. And, and, and the thing you got to always remember, as I'll talk to you in a moment, is why does God bring his word to you? You know? So we'll answer that question in a moment, all right? So to sanctify. So my soul, to get my soul in a good place, God is going to begin to render it into a place of moral uh, sense, a, a place of moral purity, all right? It results in behavior that benefits those that are sanctified. So it, it, it comes, right? God wants to bring about in my life, in your life, a change in behavior that, so that that new behavior benefits me. Right? It benefits me. Now, at the moment when you see this new behavior, you may think, well, that's weird. Nobody thinks that way. Yeah, a lot of people think that way. A lot of people are going through this. It's just probably not a lot of people on your Twitter account <laughs> or Facebook, okay? But it's, it's happening. God is bringing this to you to, to benefit your life. How many of you believe God's on your side, right? He wants to benefit your life, all right? Now, what was the next word, right? Pray your whole, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved. The word preserved means guarded, kept in safety, all right? Guarded. So, I, you, know, I, you know what? This is, I'm talking about our soul. I'm going to need to guard my heart. My soul. I'm going to have to keep my soul in a good place. Keep it in a safe place. Huh? It means to maintain it, to watch vigilantly. I need to, be, I need to pay attention to what's coming into my soul. Okay, what, what's coming into my soul? What's coming to affect my passions, my affections? Right? What, what, what is your soul? The seat of your senses, your desires, your affections, your appetites, your, your passions. So what... What, what, what's coming, what's, what's trying to come in, what, what's trying to, to affect my, my, make me hungry for something, you know? Now suddenly I, I've got to have this when I went 40 years and never thought about it. So where did that come from? Hmm? And if it's good, wonderful. But if it's not, really? Okay? Is that good? All right, and then blameless means without fault. Without fault. Without fault. So I can bring my soul, God's word, God will help me to bring my soul to the place where it's working with me and for me and not against me. It's not being an issue. It's not being a problem. Okay? Now, none of us come into the kingdom of God with that already there. This is a process that we begin to go through. Spirit, soul, and body. Some more than others, but all of us. All right? Now, back to Hebrews 4, right? He said that, that the word of God divides the center of the thoughts and intents. Is a discerner. The word discerner means judge. Of the thoughts, you're going to love this definition. I looked up the word thoughts in the Bible dictionary. It said, what you think. <laughs> I may be glad you came. That really helped, didn't it? Huh? But here, but listen to this one, the intense. I, if you're taking notes tonight, I really suggest you write this, these three words down because I'm going to keep referring back to it. Are you happy you came so far? Yeah. Right? So the word intense is very important, very important, right? The thoughts and intents of the heart. The word intense in the Greek dictionary, Bible dictionary means ideas. The ideas. So it's a judge of the ideas. Hey, not every idea I get came from heaven. Not every idea is going to give me a better life. Not every idea is a moral idea. Not every idea, come on, you can jump in. Not every idea. Ideas need to be judged. All right? It means notions, notions, and purpose. Purpose. All right? So I submit to you that ideas and notions equals purpose. If you think about something long enough and you meditate on it long enough, it's going to bring a purpose to your life. Okay? We are purpose-driven. We were made in the image and likeness of God, and God is a purpose-driven God. So we are purpose-driven. 
It's where a lot of people get messed up in life, quite honestly, is when they lose purpose. They don't have a reason to get up in the morning. They don't have something to go do. They, hmm? That's why I will never retire. <laughs> Got to have a purpose. All right? Now, here's the big verse. Go with me to 3 John, verse 2, the third epistle of John. It's way back by the book of Revelation. All right? So if you go to the book of Revelation and go left, you'll run into Jude, and then you'll run into 3 John. It's only one chapter. It's only one chapter. I've got some amazing definitions for you tonight that I've never given in 40 years, some new things I've discovered that I'm going to share with you tonight that's going to really help you. Hmm? Are you glad you came? 3 John. All right, look at this now. Uh, this is John the Apostle writing. That John. The John. Peter, James, and John. That John. All right? He calls himself the elder unto the well-beloved Goliath whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish. I wish they had translated this correctly. It should say pray. I pray above all things. It's quite a statement when you think about it. This is John the apostle. The brother could pray about a lot of things. Hmm? He had a lot of understanding. He understood a lot. Okay, he said, this is what I pray for you above all things. Look at it, that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. That you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. All right, now the first thing I want to talk to you about here is the word prosper. A lot of times when people read that word, they think he's strictly talking about money. He is not excluding money, but he's talking about much more than money. It's got to be much more than money. Because you know what? You can have a ton of money and be a miserable human being. Okay? It doesn't guarantee you will be. You know, a friend of mine once said, he said, you know, Charles, money can't buy you happiness, but it can get you a condo right next door. <laughs> you can look over the wall and see it from there. Okay, it's not in the Bible, but I thought it was pretty funny. All right, and there was an element of truth in it. Okay, life is better when you're not broke. How many of you would agree with me on that? Right, it's better when you're not broke. All right, so he's not excluding money. This word prosper includes money, but it includes much more than money. Okay, it literally means that you have a good, safe journey through life. He said, I pray that you have a good, listen, listen to the wording, a good, safe journey through life. That you have a good, safe journey through life. Good, listen to the word, good. How many of you want to have a good journey through life, right? A good, safe, safe journey, a good, safe journey. Life is a journey, right? Right? Good, safe journey. I love the visual there. I love what it paints on the inside of me, right? So he said, I pray that you have a good, safe journey through life. Now, that would include financial help, financial blessing, but it includes much more than that. Amen? I think we can all see that. He said, and that you be in health. The word health there means that you be healthy. All right? God wants you to be healthy. He's not anti. God's not pro-sickness. God is pro-health. How many of you got kids? How many of you want your kids to be healthy? Anybody in here want your kids to be sick? If you do, you're sick. <laughs> Nobody wants their kids to be sick. Everybody wants their kids to be healthy. Well, so does your Heavenly Father. Your Heavenly Father wants his kids to be healthy. Huh? How many of you want your kids to do better financially than you've done? Amen. Amen. Well, if you then being evil know how to good good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to his children, right? So just what Jesus said in Matthew, right? So Jesus wants that. So it includes that, but it's not limited to that. All right? So he says, I pray that you have a good, safe journey through life, that you be healthy. And then he adds this thought to it, even as your soul prospers. Bam! That should turn on like, like if I turned that screen to white and turned it up full max. I never will because we'll burn your retinas. All right? But the re no, that's not a joke. It really will do that, okay? But the, the reality is, is that, is that my soul, my soul, my passions, my intents, my purpose, my thoughts, my ideas, my desires, 
needless to say, but let's say it anyway, is going to affect whether I have a safe, good journey through life and if I'm even healthy. My soul. My soul has that effect on this journey through life. He didn't say even as your spirit prospers. He said as your soul prospers. He didn't say as your flesh prospers. No, no, no. As your soul prospers or as your soul takes its journey through life, the journey your soul takes affects the journey of the rest of your life, the rest of you. It affects you. So I need to get my soul in a good place. Huh? I need to get my soul in a good place. Okay? I need to get it in a good place. And that's what we're going we're gonna to learn the next five weeks. All right, I'm done. Stand to your feet. Let's go. No, just kidding. All right? So there is a good, safe journey for our souls to travel. Our souls can be led in a good way. Right? Our souls can be led in a good way. I can, my soul can be led. L look at this. Okay? So my souls can go, can go in the right direction. All right? I, I forget to read, I, I forget to give you this. That word prosper there in 3 John 2, I forgot to give you this part of the definition. I'm sorry. I apologize. All right? So it means to have a safe, good journey through life. It also means that to give success to. So I pray that, that, that God gives success to you. Right? And that it means to be led in a good way. So God said, I pray above everything you be led in a good way. Well, I can see why a man would pray that for somebody you care about, right? I mean, I pray that for my kids all the time. I pray for my grandkids, I pray for myself, I pray for Lynn, I pray for her kids, I pray for you all, that God will lead us, that we will be led in a good way. Hmm? But you got to know what a good way is. You got to know what's good and what's not good. Got to be on guard. Got to pay attention. Hmm? Pastor, everybody's doing it. Well, that doesn't mean you're supposed to do it. Doesn't mean you're not supposed to do it. Hmm? There's a lot of things, obviously. There's a lot of things this church does not do, though lots of churches do. Why? hasn't taken them in a good way. I don't mean that judgmentally. I don't say it harshly. I don't, don't say it critically. I don't say it mean. It's just like saying today's Wednesday to me. It doesn't take you in a good way. I have guys come and see me all the time, and they say, you know, Pastor, I've been 20, Pastor, in 25 years in a town of 2 million people, and I've got 30 people. Can you help me? I said, well, tell me how you do things. And it's just like, tick, 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 tick. My question for you is, why did it take you 25 years? You should have quit doing that after 25 days. All right. And you've probably seen the same thing in your work, right? Yeah. So to be led... In a good way. Isn't that a good definition? John said, I pray that you be led in a good way. And being led in that good way is going to bring me to success. It's going to give me a good and safe journey through life. Right? But I need to let my soul be led in a good way. Because I'm going to prosper and be in health even as my soul prospers. Okay? Oh, but I've never heard anything. Yeah, you have. You've heard of Proverbs 23, right? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Hmm? If I can convince you that you are incapable and you can't amount to anything and you can't achieve anything, even though you may have an IQ that is off the charts, you know what? You're not going to do anything and you're not going to amount to anything. Because your soul is being led in a bad way and as a man thinketh. Hmm? Amen? There's a little thought for somebody. This is where it gets very interesting. When you, when, when you start coming to a good church and you start hearing good teaching and God starts revealing things to you and starts ex stuff to you, you know, that's where sometimes family doesn't get you anymore. 
because you've changed your thinking, thinking that to a large extent was put into you by them. I know, I'm sorry, but somebody's got to address this stuff and it falls on me. You know, and it's hard and it's difficult and, and, and a lot of, sometimes they respond with, wow, I love what you're doing, show me. And other times it's like, who do you think you are? Oh, now you're... And by the way, most of you are laughing, that's what most of you get. A few people get the other one. But then you have to decide, how am I going to be led? Am I going to be led in a good way into a safe, good journey through life? Or am I going to end up You're telling me I shouldn't treat my wife like this and you've been divorced four times. <laughs> or you're married, but she can't stand to be in the room with you. <laughs> and you're telling me I don't know how to... Now that seems too obvious, but it goes on all day. Hmm? And then when the word comes, you start to discern, right? For the word enters and it judges your thoughts, your intents. Your, it begins to judge that. And for the first time in your life, you go, whoa, why am I thinking like that? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Whoa. 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 Yeah, I know my dad and my brother and my uncle said to act like this, but that's dumb. Is this helping you tonight? All right, even as your soul prospers. So there is a good, safe journey for our souls to travel. Our souls can be led in a good way. As our souls go, so goes our health and our life journey. In this series, I'm going to show you some, some notions, some ideas that produce healthy souls. And I'm going to show you some notions and some ideas that produce unhealthy souls. Hmm? You know, when it comes to diet, I need to know what to eat. And I need to know what not to eat. When I go overseas, I ask people, tell me what I should eat. Because they eat some funky stuff <laughs> in other countries. <laughs> hmm? And they all, you know, they always say to me, Well, are you adventurous? Mm -mm. <laughs> not at all. I'm not having snake. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I've been to a country where they eat a lot of snake. Not, it's on the menu. Mm -mm. Only snake I want to be close to is on my shoes. That's it. <laughs> That's as far as it goes in my life, honey. All right, so here we go. So you need to know, right? You need to know what's good, what's bad. So tonight we're going to start with an unhealthy one, okay? And th but I'm going to give you some good and mix it in. Are you ready? Got 15 minutes and I got an hour worth of teaching. Go with me to Mark, the fourth chapter. I'm going to really kick it into high gear. Mark 4. I'm going to give you all this. Lord, help me. Now, for some of you, you've heard teaching on this before, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to apologize for it because you cannot hear this enough. This one, I picked this one first. I was going to put another one in tonight, one I've never taught you before, but I'm going to do that one next week. But next week, I'm going to teach something I've never taught you before about unhealthy souls, and, and, but also I'm going to teach you about the, the, counter, the, the antidote to get your soul good. All right? And then we'll, you know, we'll look at a couple, some other things. But uh, here in Mark, the fourth chapter, verse 14, is the parable of the sower sows the word. Probably the most important parable you'll ever read because in verse 13, he said, if you don't understand this one, you won't understand the rest of them. So in other words, if you don't understand what this parable is teaching about, you will never get to the place of understanding the others. The reason why is because this parable teaches you the methods that Satan uses to separate you from the word of God. And if you don't know how he's going to try to separate you, then this will kick in and you'll never get a chance to understand the rest of the word. It'll kick you out. You'll, get kicked. you'll, you'll, you'll be removed from your contact with the word 
before you ever have a chance to understand it. Hmm? If we were competing farmers, and I had a farm and you had a farm, and I grew wheat and you grew wheat, and I wanted to guarantee that my wheat was bought, what's the smartest thing I can do? Convince you not to plant. If I can somehow convince you not to plant, or if you plant, I can sneak into your field and take the seed out, then I'm guaranteed that my crop is going to grow and you're, you're not going to get anything. Now, that almost sounds too simple. But my family, if I can figure that out, you can guarantee yourself the devil's figured it out. And Jesus warns us in this parable the methods that he uses. All right, verse 14, for the sower sows the word. So here's the question. Why does God bring his word into your life? Why does God bring his word into your life? Why does God bring his word into your life? That's a good question to ask. Why does God tell you to read the word, meditate the word, understand the word, be a doer of the word? Why? Why does he bring his word into your life? Isaiah 55, 11, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It, my word, shall not return to me void. Listen, but it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it and accomplish that what I've called it to do. So God brings his word into your life to benefit your life. Make your life better, right? That his word may come and prosper in your life, lead you in a safe, good journey of life. All right? Psalm 119, let me give you the verse in case you want to go home and look it up. Psalm 119 verse 30 says, the entrance of your word brings light. So God's word comes into your life to bring light to your life. We live in a world, right, where the God of this world has blinded the eyes. He's called the God of darkness, the darkness of the world, right? So the word comes to bring light to your life. The word light comes from the Hebrew word that means order, peace to your life. So the word comes to be a light unto your path. You don't have to stumble around in the dark. Right? God's word will shine on your path. The more of the word you understand, the more light there will be in your life. You don't have to stumble around. You don't have to bump into stuff. You don't have to waste your time. You don't have to go into the ditch. Hmm? You don't have to go beat your head against the wall to learn. You can learn sitting in church. Huh? You can learn good behavior. You can learn right thinking so your life can get better. Amen. Here's just a few things I wrote down. Why does God bring his word into your life? Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God wants to live, give you the ability to live your life by faith. Not just by sight, but by faith. And he brings his word into your life, the understanding of his word, so that you can believe the word, so you can live by faith and not by sight. Beautiful. Acts chapter 20, verse 32 says, And I commend you to, the, to you have been committed to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. Which is able to build you up. So God brings his word into your life to build you up, not to tear you down, to build you up to edify you, to build you up, okay? And to give you your inheritance. That's what it says in Acts 20, verse 32. And to give you your inheritance. Hallelujah. So I don't have to, I, I, I get an inheritance? Yeah, 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 yeah. The guy that wrote the will died. Came back, but you get the inheritance. All right? So now look here. So that's all in verse 14, right? And these are they likewise where the word is sown. But when Satan, but when they have heard, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. So this is the person that's hard-hearted, right? They come to church, they hear the word, and they reject it, reject it, reject it, reject it, reject it, reject it, reject it. Nothing I can say, nothing I can do, nothing anybody can say. Music does nothing. They just reject it, reject it, just skeptical, uh, hard. That's what you call hard-hearted. It's a tragedy. But God brings the word, and he still, still reaches out to him. He knows that's the condition of it. doesn't matter. He still brings the word, still brings the word, still brings the word. Beautiful. All right? Verse 16. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, different kind of ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive with gladness. Now, because they immediately receive it, Satan is not able to immediately steal it. Okay? But they were received with gladness. This is the majority of people in church today. They receive the word of God with gladness. All right? But look what he says to them. And they have no root in themselves, and so endure before time. Afterward, an affliction or persecution. Affliction, narrowness of room, right? Persecution. You're being followed by acts of hatred. <laughs> well, you, I, I don't know if you knew this or not, but Satan hates you. You know that, right? He's not your buddy. Okay? Arises for the word's sake. So persecution and affliction arises to separate you from the word. Immediately they are offended. Now 
That's what I want to focus on in the last 10 minutes I've got. You become offended. This is one of the worst things going on in the body of Christ and in society today, in my opinion, one guy's opinion. People are offended. They're offended. They're offended. You get offended. All right? You get offended. It's so dangerous. You just can't imagine how dangerous this is. Right? The word offended there, I'm going to give you a lot of definitions. Are you ready? I mean, I looked up a lot of things. I want to give you as much of this as I can because you've got to be on guard. This really settles in a person's soul. The word offended means you become displeased, then you become resentful, and you fall back into your sinful ways. It, also in the Bible, and James it teaches us, that you become offended, and then if you don't deal with it, you get bitter. You get offended, and then you get bitter. Oof. Okay? Displeased, resentful. Displeased, resentful. Fall back into sinful ways. Bitterness, which the dictionary defines as intense hostility. Hmm? Root. Hebrews 12, 15 warned us about the root of bitterness. The root of bitterness. You know what's interesting? It's really interesting. You look at all these negative emotions in the Bible. Uh, uh, uncontrolled anger, unforgiveness, uh, all this. None of them are referred to as having a root. Bitterness is referred to as having a root. You know what the danger is with bitterness? Like any root, right? Like any root, right? You think you can be bitter in one area of your life, and we justify that bitterness. We justify it, and you get to be bitter. You don't get to be bitter like that. You get to be bitter because you became displeased. Then you became resentful. You didn't, disp you didn't deal with the displeasure. You, do you don't deal with the resentfulness, and it grows into bitterness. And the problem with bitterness is you will not be able to keep it in the area that you think you are justified to keep it in. Over 20, 30, 40 years, it's going to send its roots out, and it's going to come up in other areas of your life, and I'm going to get right to the bottom line, and you're going to end up old and by yourself. Because nobody is going to want to put up with your hostility. You better listen. God could be saving your life tonight. Hmm? But I have a right to be better. Okay, enjoy it. But there's going to be a time, I'm telling you right now, there's going to be a time when it's going to be you and your bitterness by yourselves. Because everyone else, spouses, kids, grandkids, all the rest of them are going to get fed up with your hostility. Because they're going to get in a room and they're going to say, why is he so mad at us? Why is she so mad at us? Why, why this hostility? You better watch out. You're not being led in a good way. I'm not judging you. I'm trying to help you. You're not being led in a good way. You're not going to have a safe, good journey through life. Because your soul has become unprosperous because you were offended. Am I helping anybody tonight? Okay? All right? The word, the word offended also means, in the Greek text, it denotes an enticement to conduct. An enticement to conduct, listen to this, which could ruin the person in question. That is exactly the opposite of the prayer John prayed in John 32. 3 John 2. He prayed that you have a good, safe journey through life. And this says that this, this emotion, this appetite, this, this desire, this intent, this purpose will ruin your life. Ruin your life. Oh, my gosh. I don't want to live a ruined life. How about you? I don't want to live a ruined life. I want to live a prosperous, healthy life. I want to have a good journey through life, a good, safe journey through life. Woo. Now, real quick, all of us get offended at times. Anybody in here never been offended? I mean, I've been offended at times, right? I get tempted to be offended probably several times a week. Okay? All of us get offended at times. But I'm talking about something that changes when it becomes our lifestyle. When being offended becomes, remember the dictionary definition? Our ideas, our notions, and our purpose. Being offended becomes our journey. Being offended is what leads us. Hmm? 
we end up leading offended lives. We wake up offended. You're laughing because you know some people like that, don't you? Hmm? If you're sitting next to them, just keep looking straight ahead. Okay? And thank God they came to church tonight. The entrance of his word brings light. Right? People, they just wake up offended. You've known people. I've known people that way. They wake up offended. They walk into the kitchen and they're pissed. That's the Texas definition. It's in the Bible. That word really is in the Bible. It really is. It is a Bible word. All right? So, not in the way I use it, but it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. Okay? And so they just, they, what, what's the deal, right? We're laughing at it, but man, that's, that's not cool, right? And it, and it has become their way of life. And that's now their flow. That's the flow of their life. Hmm? They're displeased. They're resentful. And if you, well, I got reasons to be this. I got reasons to be, okay, fine. Stay with it. Hang on to it, honey. Hang on to it, Bubba. And we'll be hearing about you. Bitter and by yourself. That's where you're going. That's where this is taking you. Listen to this. Let me give you this definition. Right? The word offended comes from the Greek word scandalon. We get our word scandal or scandalized from it. It literally means the trigger of a trap. Listen to the verbiage. Listen to how God defines this. The trigger of a trap on which the bait is placed. So Satan will bait me. He will bait me. He will bait me. Ooh, that makes me mad just thinking about it. Right? That he will bait me. The trigger of a trap in which the bait is placed, which when touched by an animal, springs and causes it to close, causing entrapment. So now I'm trapped. My life is scandalized because I'm offended. Whew. Now, you may never make the cover of National Enquirer, but your life is scandalized compared to what it could have been. Hmm? I'm a child of God living an offended life. Seriously? Okay, almost done. Can I keep you five more minutes and I'll let you go? Let me give you some more definitions. Is this good? Are we learning anything? I said, all of us get offended at times. The danger is when it becomes our lifestyle, our idea, our notion, our purpose, our journey. It's what leads us. Now, it's more than a moment. It's a journey. It's more than a moment. Okay? It's more than a moment. I don't want you to become afraid because, you know, you got offended at somebody on the freeway for 30 seconds. Okay. But if, if you're always offended, you're always mad, you're always displeased, you're always resentful, you better deal with it. Hmm? It's when it starts in the morning and carries through the day. The Random House, Bible, the Random House College Dictionary defines the word offended as meaning resentful displeasure, to cause to fall into sinful ways. Can you believe that? That's a secular dictionary. It says that Offense will cause you to fall into sinful ways. The synonyms are, are that you're provoked, and as a result is you insult because you feel you have been insulted. Wow. Do we see this in our world today, or do we see this in our world today? It is astounding to me how many people walk around offended. And they think that gives them the right to insult everyone. Hmm? Webster's 1828 dictionary means this. That offended means the people go on the attack. Ooh. You know anybody that's always on attack mode? They're offended. That's an offended life. To attack, to make angry, to shock, to wound to annoy, to disturb, to cause to fall or stumble, to draw to evil or hinder in obedience. Wow. To be scandalized, to act. 
I can't even read my own handwriting. <laughs> oh, unjustly, no, to act injuriously or unjustly. Okay, so the word displeased repeats there several times. Did you notice that in several of the different, the word displeasure appears? Hmm? The word displeased means easy Oh, here it is. To make angry, often, often, often in a slight degree. So you shouldn't be angry, but you are. You shouldn't even be upset about it, but you're angry. You shouldn't even be upset. It's something slight, and yet. Hmm? You've lifted off. Oh, that's just the way I am. Okay, and, what, and how's that working? I'm asking, how's that working? Is your circle of friends growing? <laughs> I promise you, it's shrinking. Is your influence and in family strengthening? Mm -mm. It's getting smaller. Do people want to be with you? No, they're making excuses to stay away from you. They'll even lie not to have to come to, around you. It's amazing. All right? To make angry, often in a slight degree. Listen to this. The synonym of displeased is, are you ready for this? You're exasperated. I'm so exasperated with you. Oh, my God. Okay, we're laughing, but it's not funny. Last thought. Well, last couple of thoughts. Offended people tend to be self-righteous. Believe me when I tell you this, I've known offended people. Okay? I've done a study on offended people. I've studied this for years. I'm telling you, offended people, you meet somebody self-righteous, they're always right and everybody else all, they're offended. They're offended. They tend to be self-righteous, hypercritical. These are the guys that pound their steering wheels on the freeway. <laughs> Some of you are like looking at the person next to you like... Well, look, Bubba, maybe nobody will dress you. Maybe nobody just so it's my, my job to address you. You've never done that on the freeway? What that guy just did to you, you've never done it? Yeah, you have. Stop it. <laughs> Jesus said, if you don't have sin, you can chunk a rock. If you've got sin, drop your rock and go walk away. Amen. All right? Offended of people are hypercritical people. Let me tell you something else. Offended of people are unhappy people. They're unhappy people. Unhappy people. They could be at a birthday party with chocolate cake, with fudge icing, with ice cream and hot fudge, and they're unhappy. <laughs> they're judgmental, angry, no grace, no joy. I've never met a joyful, offended person. <laughs> no joy. Unthankful. You'll never get a thank you out of them. Because no matter what you do, you could have done it better. Or they could have done it better. Or somebody else already did it better. And you didn't really make enough effort. Really? That's what you got me? No, that was a mistake. I didn't get you anything. I'm going to go over here. <laughs> You're grateful, sir. So what's the cure, Pastor? You got a scripture for us? Yeah, I got it. It's First Charles 5, 3. Get over it. Get over it. I say that to you in love. Listen to me. What are you, if you're in here tonight and you're offended all the time, what are you doing to your life, my friend? What are you doing to your life? You're not, gonna, you're not living a safe, good life. You're not living, that's not your journey. It's not your journey. This is not working. What's it getting you? 
all this anger, all this criticalness, all this self-righteousness, all this judgmental, all this unhappiness, what's it getting you? Is that really what you want? Hmm? Is it getting you health? Is it getting you prosperity? Is it getting you love? Is it getting you peace? Is it getting you friends? It's not. It's not working. Get over it. Ask God to help you see good again. Ask God to help you see good again. There's a lot of good in there. Yeah, but Charles is like, I know, but there's a lot of good. There's a lot of good people. There's a lot of people doing good stuff. And guess what? Nobody's perfect. Everybody's a work in progress, including you. <laughs> Amen? Stand your feet with me, please. Did we, did we get off to a good start tonight? Amen. Amen. Let's pray real quick, and I'll let you go. I've kept you a little later, and I like to on school night. Father, in the name of Jesus, we receive your word into our lives tonight. God, we pray above all things that, that you give success to our lives, that you lead us in a good way. Hallelujah. That you give us good, safe journey through life. You give us health. That you lead our souls. Help us to lead our souls in a good way. And stay away from being offended. Displeased, resentful. We're not going to let that nasty stuff grow in us. We're going to forgive and be forgiven. We're going to walk in love. We're going to go forward with life. We're going to be joyful and enjoy life and give grace to people because we sure want it for ourselves. In Jesus' name, if you agree, say amen. amen.